Well, you know, as uh, Tim mentioned, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about amphibians and reptiles today. And I'm, you know, that's always been my, my, my primary interest. Uh, but really, broadly, I'm interested in vertebrate conservation and ecology. And so I've, you know, published work on mammals, you know, fish, uh, a little bit on birds, but primarily reptiles is, is what my, you know, most of my published work is on. And so um, I'm at the University of Wisconsin Whitewater right now, which I love. It's a small school, lots of hands on outdoor teaching opportunities for kids. Um, much more so than, you know, when I was, you know, I did my PhD at UW-Milwaukee, which was a great place for graduate school. But when you have large class sizes as an undergraduate there, it would have been harder to, to do those types of things. So I'm really excited to be at a small, um, not exactly rural, but almost rural school. Uh, I mean, we're close to Madison and Milwaukee, but at the same time, um, we're kind of uh, in the country a little bit at the at, at Whitewater, and so it's it's really nice to be able to easily take the kids out and and uh, work uh, in wild spaces. And you know, Tim had mentioned uh, this book, and I so one of the reasons that I get that I get asked to speak a lot these days is because of this book that I was uh, involved with. And um, as, as Tim sort of hinted at, I, I am not here to hawk books to you. Like that, that's not my primary focus whatsoever. Uh, and normally um, I would not talk about the book uh, simply because I don't want it to be perceived that I'm trying to push you to buy it. However, I think that there are characteristics of this book that make it particularly valuable to a wide variety of people. And so I want to just highlight those characteristics, because if we look at the book in its physical form, right, it is almost 1200 pages, and it weighs over nine pounds. So it is a large book that can be intimidating. And, and so I want to talk about some of the things that that, you know, people shouldn't be intimidated by the book. Uh, it's just got a lot of information in it. So just some of the to highlight some some of the uh, sort of characteristics. It's large. Um, there's many, many color photographs. If you page through it, lots of the UW Press was uh, uh, really great about just saying, yeah, yeah, you can as many color photographs as you want, we're going to do it. And so uh, it's over two, it has over 2000 citations in it. So it is a sort of in part, you know, meant to be a robust scientific document. Now, one of the characteristics of it that I'm particularly pleased about is that um, my myself and Donald Brown, um, we edited the book. We also wrote, you know, large portions of it, but we edited the book. There are over 50 contributing professionals. And so many people were able to contribute expertise on different organisms. And we tried to make sure that those people had experience um, or at least knowledge of amphibians and reptiles in Wisconsin or in the sort of greater upper Midwest area if we couldn't find someone specifically from Wisconsin. But it made it a nice group effort, which I really, really am pleased with. Um, what's in the book? Well, we have an in-depth review of identification, which any book should have. Um, but we, we focus not just on adult identification, but also juvenile identification and identification of eggs for species that lay eggs. So uh, very detailed information on identification, if that's something that people are interested in. So this is actually a, a picture of just one of our dichotomous keys in the book. So in each species account, there is text to help identify species, but we also have dichotomous keys at the start of the book. Uh, this is the one focused specifically on larval salamanders. Uh, you can see there's artwork that is uh, really, really nice artwork by Dr. Eric Wild, who used to be at Stevens Point, and he did um, the illustrations for the book uh, in areas where we needed illustrations. Um, and then each species account on top of covering identification also covers these different subjects, taxonomy, evolution, distribution, habitat, reproduction, activity, predators, prey, uh, the stuff you would expect from a, a book about the biology of a group of organisms. And at the end of each species account, we also include a in-depth section on conservation and management for each species. And actually conservation and management is something that we tried to focus on heavily in the book. We all know that species are going extinct today at a rapid rate and uh, declining at a rapid rate. And typically books of this nature don't focus 
quite so heavily on conservation and management, but we wanted to make sure that was a primary focus of our book. And so each species account has a section on conservation and management. And we also have at the beginning an entire chapter devoted to broad concepts in the conservation and management of amphibians and reptiles in Wisconsin. So this is a figure from that uh, front chapter um, this is showing the sort of transition of land here in the state from the mid 1800s until um, 2006. So this is this map on the right is almost 20 years old and we'll come back to this map, but you can see a large shift. Hopefully nobody is, is red, green, colorblind. And if you are, I apologize, but um, a large shift from reds and greens in the mid 1800s to yellows, which is agricultural land. So this is an example of something we highlighted in that uh, conservation and management chapter. Um, in the management portion of that chapter, we go through specifics about different habitat types that amphibians and reptiles would live in and the sort of ways in which you can manage that property and how it affects amphibians or manage that habitat and how it affects amphibians and reptiles. So here is just a, uh, an example. This is from the prairie grassland and savanna management uh, subchapter and uh, highlighting prescribed fire and how you use it and how it affects amphibians and reptiles theoretically. So clearly from all of this information, we can see the book has value to professionals. And that was a goal, right? Donald and I both said, well, when we were graduate students or now as academics and educators, what type of information would we find valuable? Obviously as much as you could possibly have, right? But we also wanted this book to be useful for people that weren't professional educators, weren't professional natural resource regulators, weren't consultants, you know, people that just had a passing interest in natural resources or wildlife or the outdoors. And so we have characteristics that make this book or that we try to incorporate to make this book very approachable and accessible to everybody despite its intimidating size. First of all, as I mentioned, all of those color figures, right? So here we've got just an example from the Cope's Gray Tree Frog, one page of the Cope's Gray Tree Frog chapter. Um, and you can see we have, you know, full color photos, there are, are, are hundreds of color photos, very beautiful. Again, UW Press pulled out all the stops. They did not restrict us in the number of color photos uh, or figures or illustrations, which is outstanding. So there's always you know, nice pictures to look at for anybody. We also have a number of introductory chapters that we tried to make interesting to people with a variety of sort of interests uh, in their own background. So there's a chapter on uh, historical figures in Wisconsin herpetolo herpetology. This is one that I wrote and I, it was one of my favorite chapters to write in the book um, because it was really fun to look back at some of these historical figures and, and you know, what they did and, and some of their activities. And this, I came across this picture when I was working on that chapter and I absolutely love it. Um, this picture shows past um, curators from the Milwaukee Public Museum, along with several other individuals that they're out in the field on a field collecting trip to collect specimens for the Milwaukee Public Museum in the 20s. And so this is Pope and Dickinson. Those were both uh, herp and fish people at um, Milwaukee Public Museum. But what I love about this picture is that right here, they have their little tea set and lunch on top of a box. And inside of that box, which is locked tight are rattlesnakes that they had collected for their uh, expedition. So um, really, really cool stuff like that. And it's uh, fun anecdotes to read. Um, and then we have a chapter on Wisconsin vegetative communities and what in a general sense, those include, I mean, I'm not a botanist. Donald's not a botanist, obviously. Uh, Emmett Judewitz helped us write this chapter. Uh, he wrote Wildflower or co-wrote Wildflowers of Wisconsin for people who aren't uh, familiar with that name. Uh, but we wanted to make sure we talked in a little more detail about, you know, the types of vegetative communities available for amphibians and reptiles with lots of pictures. And then each chapter related to a species. It has all of that detailed information I mentioned before, but we start each chapter off, each species account, I should say, off with what we refer to as an at a glance section. And the at a glance section is basically a, a long paragraph that summarizes everything you would need to know about that organism in brief. So this is for the slender glass lizard, talks about identification, where you can find them, their habitats, et cetera, et cetera, what their status is. Um, so if you don't want to wade through that entire species account, you don't have to. You can just look at this 
uh, summary and, and get the gist of what you need from it. So you don't have to read through all that dense scientific material. And then emulating the book by Richard Vogt, which was published in um, 1980. His was the 81, I'm sorry. His was the last book on amphibians and reptiles uh, for Wisconsin and, and the last sort of thick scientific or uh, uh, robust treatise on amphibians and reptiles in Wisconsin. And his book is much beloved among herpetologists uh, because he included so much personal information and as well as scientific information, also anecdotes. And we wanted to emulate that, um, but we wanted to make sure that the anecdotal information was sort of separated out a little bit. And so we included throughout the book, these things called natural history boxes. And these are separate boxes like you see here. This is a one I picked at random about prairie skinks, um, but these highlight either unique observations we've made or unique interactions we've had with amphibians and reptiles, or maybe uh, a unique story, something that didn't quite fit into the rest of the account, but was still quite interesting. Uh, we wanted to include it. So, you know, for example, I, I include in the, the, the gopher snake chapter, an anecdote about uh, a gopher snake I was tracking with radio telemetry equipment for my dissertation research that ended up um, in somebody's house. And I had to walk around in their house in, you know, with my shoes off and stocking feet with a big antenna swinging around inside of their dining room. So um, there's all sorts of little stories and, and things like that throughout the book. So we, we included all of this again to make sure that there was something you could just pick the book up and page through and find something interesting to look at if you didn't want to do a deep dive into the sort of ecology of a given organism at that moment. So anyways, enough about that book. Um, uh, again, I'm not trying to hawk it to you. You can get it at the library. I'm thrilled if you would, um, because I think it has useful information for anybody in it that likes natural resources. What I want to talk more about today is sort of, um, in general, amphibians and reptiles in Wisconsin and some of the conservation uh, issues that face them, and then highlight some specific case studies uh, or case organisms, case examples of uh, conservation difficulties here in Wisconsin. And, and this is applicable to a wide range geographically. It's not only applicable to Wisconsin, these conservation issues. But um, what I wanna first talk about is our sort of diversity, right? So species richness in Wisconsin is not massive, right? It's not compared to Louisiana or Florida. You know, we don't have a, 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 a massive species richness. The largest number of species we have is with snakes, right? Um, lizards are particularly depauperate. Right? We only have four lizard species here in Wisconsin. But, you know, so when you, you talk to people about amphibians and reptiles in Wisconsin, if they're from the South, they'll be like, well, who cares? There's not that many, it can't be that interesting. But in my opinion, um, this sort of wealth of species that we have here in Wisconsin isn't necessarily mind-blowingly interesting because there's a huge diversity or species richness. It's most interesting to me because the organisms we have have to interact with a highly variable environment and a breadth of different conditions. Um, if we consider that where we're located geographically, uh, we have have a huge range of habitats available, a huge range of environmental conditions available. And, you know, we consider that these organisms have to survive very harsh winters. Um, we exist at the periphery of many of their geographic distributions globally. And so because of that, they have to sort of exist in these areas that are not necessarily primo habitat uh, environmentally for them. So they have all these really cool adaptations for survival. And that's where they're most interesting to me. So if we take a look at the diversity of Wisconsin's ecological provinces and sections, you can see, and this is a, a, a figure from the book again, you can see we have this sort of Laurentian mixed forest uh, operating sort of in the north, northeast-ish part of the state, Midwest broadly forest operating in the sort of south, southwest-ish region of the state. But within each of these are all of these different sections, Wisconsin central sands, the northern central Wisconsin uplands, the northern highlands, all of these have different conditions and different sort of characteristics that amphibians and reptiles have to adapt to or choose somewhere else to be evolutionarily. So we have this massive mix of different habitats and conditions, hot dry prairie, northern forest, southern forest, large wetland, small wetland, large rivers, small river streams, lakes, right? And then added on top of that, the need to overwinter or survive sometimes maybe seven to nine months out of the year without being active. 
All right, so here in Wisconsin, we also have a number of imperiled species. So this figure shows the species in Wisconsin that are listed specifically as endangered. Um, here is a ribbon snake. And actually there are two ribbon snake species that are endangered in Wisconsin. Uh, they just both look identical. So I only included one uh, picture here, but the Massasauga, which is a, a rattlesnake, a venomous snake, and that is endangered in Wisconsin. Blanchard's cricket frog, the queen snake, the slender glass lizard in the lower left, which despite the fact it looks like a snake is actually a legless lizard. And then the ornate box turtle in the lower right. That is the only fully terrestrial turtle species that we have here in Wisconsin. So we look at this and we say, all right, well, these are the endangered species. That's not not that many really what well, we've got if you consider that there is uh, two ribbon snakes, there are seven endangered species, big deal. Well, if we start to add the species that are threatened, special concern, protected to this slide, then this slide becomes much more crowded. And this isn't even all of them, right? But the slide becomes much more crowded. We see there's actually quite a few species in the state that have some sort of, you know, designation uh, status as being potentially imperiled. And we also have to remember that those designations while they are based on ecological information, they have to get approved by legislature. So there might be species that probably should be listed that just can't get political support to be listed and approved for some level of protection. The fact that we have as many uh, snakes, in my opinion, protected as we do is astounding because it's pretty hard to convince people um, in a political sense, yes, you should. it should be okay to add this species to the threat endangered special concern list. So if we look at the proportion that our endangered species are of all of our species, you can see it's pretty high, right? We have 37% of our amphibians are listed as endangered or special concern. 42% uh, of our reptiles are listed as threatened, endangered, or special concern. So it's a really high proportion, right? It's a lot of a lot of our you know relatively low species richness made up of imperiled species. And so that's really problematic, uh, very concerning, right? So Obviously, when we see high numbers of imperiled species or species that have a problem, we think, well, why does this occur? What are the threats that amphibians and reptiles face uh, that makes them imperiled? And there is a huge breadth, and all of these apply, generally speaking, uh, globally to many different types of uh, situations, not just Wisconsin. But obviously, overharvesting can be a problem. Now, we usually think of overharvesting in regards to whitetail deer or game fish, but um, everybody here, probably as a kid in grade school or high school, dissected leopard frogs those were all wild caught, right? They weren't growing those in a lab somewhere at that time. And so massive, massive numbers of things like leopard frogs were harvested from the wild uh, to sort of satisfy biological supply companies' needs. So that has an impact. Uh, human persecution is a big one, especially for snakes. Many people fear snakes and will just outright kill them on site uh, or have historically and, and still do today. Um, but here in Wisconsin and in other places, the, the, the bigger issue for specifically rattlesnakes, which are often the, the types of snakes that draw people's ire and, and end up getting killed, um, they were uh, considered a bountied organism uh, until the 70s. There is an active bounty to kill rattlesnakes where people could get paid per rattlesnake deal they turned in at the county level. So it's a lot different to say people kill things when they happen to find them uh, than to say people are getting paid to go out and find things and kill them. Right? So that bounty had a big impact on rattlesnakes in the state. We have a number of problematic species um, that, that end up indirectly or sometimes directly impacting amphibians and reptiles. Human subsidized predators, raccoons, opossums like we were talking about before, skunks, things that do really well in disturbed landscapes also have a tendency to dig up turtle nests. Uh, and that can be very problematic. Uh, invasive plants have huge impacts on native vegetative communities. Uh, and cause massive, massive problems to the habitats available to amphibians and reptiles. Pollution, everybody is aware of, you know, the impacts that pesticides and fertilizers and all of these can potentially have specifically on amphibians, but indirectly on many types of uh, wildlife, not just amphibians. Uh, 
Disease is a big problem. Chytrid fungus, uh, these are some of these are relatively new diseases that have been, you know, found to have massive impacts on amphibians globally. There have been a large number of declines and extinctions due to chytrid fungus globally. Uh, so snake fungal disease is something that exists here in Wisconsin even. So these are problems that face amphibians and reptiles globally, not just in Wisconsin. But aside from all of these, the number one reason, most sources will confirm the number one reason why species globally, not just in Wisconsin, but globally decline or go extinct is due to loss of habitat, right? So destruction of habitat, fragmentation of habitat, degradation of habitat. Right? Not just we're steamrolling this and turning it into a parking lot, but we're going to sort of steamroll part of it. And then that part that we steamroll is going to be a parking lot. And then we're going to mow the other part of it. So it's not like it's completely destroyed, but it kind of is. It's so degraded that nothing would really want to use it. Right. So these have huge impacts on species globally and also in Wisconsin. This is that map that I uh, sort of flashed on the screen earlier, and I'm going to show it to you in a little more detail, but here is our distribution of, of land categories in the mid-1800s. Again, this is a these are figures from the, the book. Um, you can see lots of red and green in here, which is forest and grassland shrub habitat. And when we compare that to 2006, this is a map that's almost 20 years old now, but when we compare that to 2006, you can see a huge shift from grassland forest to working land. Right. So in the form of agriculture, right, we also see lots of urban areas right here in the Milwaukee area. We see lots of urban areas. Right. So these areas here, heavy urban areas. So a big shift away from that forest and grassland to working land and uh, 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 agri I'm sorry, urban areas. So that clearly has to have had a massive impact on amphibians and reptiles here in Wisconsin. There's absolutely no way it couldn't have. If we look at the southern part of the state, it is almost completely transitioned from forest grassland to agricultural and urban land, right? That's a massive difference than what we had in the mid 1800s. Now, amphibians and reptiles have additional problems when it comes to habitat loss and degradation. And one of those has to do with um, connectivity, right? So what do we mean by connectivity? Well, most or many amphibians and reptiles, I should say, require multiple habitat types for the sort of uh, to meet their annual uh, life's uh, history needs. Right. So if we consider um, that many amphibians and reptiles require at least two, maybe more habitat types to meet and maintain their life history needs in a given year, we can imagine, well, this is problematic if they have problems with uh, habitat decline and they require one habitat type, well, that's bad, but now they need two different or three habitat types, then it becomes really, really problematic. So consider the connection, uh, the most obvious example would involve amphibians, right? So here is a blue spotted salamander and blue spotted salamanders as adults can hang out in upland habitat. Uh, they're one of the most common sort of uh, upland salamander species that exist as adults. But just like all amphibians, their eggs and larvae have to develop in the water. So they need both upland habitat when they're adults and wetland habitat when they're juveniles and larvae to exist, right? Everybody here, I'm sure, knows all about this. So that's problematic because now you don't just need that sort of woodland shrubby edge habitat as an adult, you also need a high quality wetland to develop your young so that you can maintain your population, right? Many species here in the state also require two different habitats for the active season and the overwintering season, right? So they have specific needs. Maybe they're a grassland prairie species during the active season, but in the winter, they have to get away from that really harsh uh, 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 cold and snow that exists here in Wisconsin for several, many months, actually. So they need two different locations where they can do that, right? Great example of this involves turtles. So turtles in the winter um, have to have a specific habitat that they survive in, right? So they, they, they have to find a water body that either is very well oxygenated in the winter or at the very least doesn't freeze solid in the winter, right? So interestingly, we would expect them to find maybe an area where there's an upwelling of water, right? Where they can just overwinter because they won't come to the surface for many months, right? They can absorb oxygen through um, 
tissues in uh, their anal tissues and also other parts of their body. So they don't necessarily need to come to the surface to breathe as long, breathe as, long as there's enough oxygen in the water for them. But many of them don't even have that opportunity. So if we consider a snapping turtle that is completely sealed under a thick layer of ice in a deep pond, well, that snapping turtle can't get to the surface in a pond. There's not a lot of like movement of water uh, to create oxygenation. And so they have to basically switch to an anaerobic metabolism, which means they start to metabolize without burning oxygen. And that works great if you can do it. Uh, but the byproduct of that is the buildup of uh, lactic acid, which is bad. However, turtles have a lot of calcium and phosphorus because they've got that big shell. They've got a lot of calcium and phosphorus in their body that they can mobilize to help kind of offset all of that buildup of acid. They still have to get to the surface eventually and use oxygen. But the point is, is that they have to have a specific environment that they can overwinter in that allows them to use the tools available to sort of survive. So they need deeper or sort of water bodies that have flowing portions of it to make it through the winter. In the active season, however, that snapping turtle that was hanging out in this really deep pond, for example, uh, has to go to, or typically will move to another location, a nearby water body or something that's adjacent along the water system that has a lot of productivity, right? Usually shallower water, lots of sun penetration. So there's lots of photosynthesis and many organisms that eat plants and then organisms that eat the organisms that eat plants. So there's lots of things for that snapping turtle to eat. So if those two different habitats are sort of uh, not intact, in other words, there's not a connection between these habitats, whether it's the overwintering and active season habitats for species or the upland wetland for amphibians, then we have real problems, right? So it's bad enough that you need to have intact multiple habitats available, but then you have to consider that there has to be a way to get to those multiple habitats. And if there is a divider between those habitats, then we have some real issues, right? We have some real issues. So everybody at some point or another has heard of or seen something like this where you have a road that bisects an upland from a wetland where amphibians breed. So in the spring, all of those adults have to get and survive getting across that road to get to the wetland to breed. And in the fall, all of those juveniles after they metamorphose have to move back to the upland for the winter. And that results in massive mortality. So that, you know, it's not just that you have one habitat, you might have several habitats, and then you have to have connections between those habitats. So lots of challenges, right? Lots of problems, lots of ways in which habitat can impact these organisms. So I... I don't, sometimes I don't talk about this because the idea of assigning value to living things is sort of cringy to me, but I get asked it so frequently uh, when I give talks that I decided I just sort of keep it as a regular part of this presentation. And that is, you know, I frequently ask, well, well, who cares, right? They're just little frogs or they're just snakes, you know, and organisms that are slimy. Sometimes people think they're gross. Sometimes people think they're something to be afraid of or nervous about such as snakes. So what value do they have? Um, and, you know, the reality is I could talk about ecological value a lot. We could talk about their useful predators, their useful prey and all of that. And those are clearly relevant uh, here. But what I like to talk about to especially, um, you know, the sort of value of amphibians and reptiles, because when people ask this question, they're usually asking it specifically, well, why should I care? Or why should humanity care about amphibians and reptiles? Not what is their value ecologically? So what I always like to point to is the fact that in my opinion, there's probably not a better group of of organisms, um, vertebrates that can connect, directly connect people to wildlife, right? Now, you might think that's crazy. People are afraid of snakes. People think frogs are gross. But the reality is that is a learned behavior, right? That is something that is passed on from parents or grandparents. You should be afraid of that snake. Don't touch it, right? Oh my gosh, don't touch that frog. It's slimy and gross, right? If we don't engage in that behavior, and if kids have not been around people that engage in that behavior, amphibians and reptiles offer this incredible opportunity for us to directly interact with wildlife, right? So I can take, for example, my students out in the field, as in this picture, and, and we can catch gopher snakes, right? We can catch frogs. They can hold those in their hands. Here is a, a species of wildlife that you have access to, right? It allows for this direct connection to develop. I can't take them out and say, hey, I want you to hold that coyote, right? 
I can't take them out and say, we're going to hold this bald eagle, right? We can't do those things, right? But we can do that. They can not only hold these, they can catch them themselves, right? So this isn't somebody holding a, a, a bird that they've caught in a mist net and saying, here, you can hold this for a second, right? This is go out and catch that thing and bring it back and we will talk about it, right? So that allows for the development of very strong connections and appreciation for wildlife I've found. And in fact, most people that I, the students that I take out on these trips who think they're afraid of snakes, they're the first ones I make hold snakes and almost in, or at least touch them. And invariably they're like, oh, that wasn't that bad. I'm like, of course it wasn't. I wouldn't make you do something that's really terrible, um, but it helps build this connection. And what's cool about it is that transcends age, right? So these college age kids on the right of this slide are just as thrilled to hold those critters as these grade school age kids on the left. So these organisms provide a outstanding opportunity for us to make direct connections to wildlife. The reason why I am a wildlife ecologist today is because as a kid, I caught frogs and turtles. So we can really sort of foster that with, with younger folks and make it the norm to not be afraid of wildlife and think of wildlife as something that's valuable. All right, so I said I was gonna talk about some case examples and I've been talking, 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 which I'm something I like to do, unfortunately, but I am gonna talk about a few species that provide particular challenges or create particular challenges for amphibian and reptile conservation uh, here in Wisconsin and also throughout their range. The first that I wanna discuss is one of these rattlesnakes that I'd mentioned. This is the Massasauga, right? The Massasauga is a small species, right? Coiled up, it's maybe the size of a dinner plate, uh, not a very large uh, snake. Um, it is what we would consider a quote unquote swamp rattler. So, or it has been called a swamp rattler in the past. In other words, it likes hanging out in wetland habitat or did historically. Um, and so I wanna show a quote to you, a couple of quotes. The first one is from Thomas McKinney in 1827. He's talking about a location in Columbia County. And he says in this source about Massasaugas, the whole country is full of them. And so constant is the noise of their rattles that the ear is kept half the time deceived by what seems to be the ticking of watches in a watchmaker's window. So this species, which is currently endangered at one point in time at this location was so abundant that it sounded like you were in a watchmaker's shop when you walked through an area that had massasaugas, right? So this species that now is impossible to find in the wild was once so massively abundant that this guy, you know, most of these old sources don't talk a lot about snakes, unless it's about something that's really, really astonishing. And this really astonished him, right? And it's even astonishing to us today. Another quote, this is from, uh, from a source by Olin, but he's talking about, you know, something that uh, a person, an anecdote a person wrote about 100 years prior to him. And he's talking about Milwaukee. In Milwaukee, parts of Milwaukee, you know, that's a floodplain, right, of the Great Lakes, which is wetland habitat that something like a Massasauga might really appreciate. He says, the first day we mowed, we killed a quantity of rattlesnakes. I will not say a thousand for fear someone will think it's a snake story. So in this one little location, this one individual mowed and killed theoretically a thousand rattlesnakes on accident. Right? So these sort of anecdotes bring this sort of a picture to our head of, a, of an organism in massive, massive abundance, right? Massive abundance. So many of them that if you mow a plot, you kill a thousand. So many of them that if you walk through an area, it sounds like you're in a watchmaker shop. So it begs the question then, today it's endangered and globally, I'm sorry, at the, at the national level, considered threatened by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. So what happened? The species that was once so massively abundant and now is either endangered or threatened. Well, in Wisconsin, one of the main problems was the bounty that I had mentioned before, right? The bounty had huge impacts on uh, the rattlesnake species here in the state. As an example, Richard Thiel um, highlighted, um, Richard Thiel uh, highlighted information he had collected in a report to the Wisconsin DNR. And he's talking about a four township area in Juneau County over a 10 year period. And in this area, um, there were over 4,200 rattlesnake bounties paid out. Now, given the location, these were all Massasaugas. There's not habitat for timber rattlesnakes there. So these were all Massasaugas. So in this 10-year period, in just a four-township area, not the entire county, 
but in the four township area, over 4,200 Massasauga bounties were paid out. Now, what is really sad about this is that when you look at the data he compiled after 1962, that number gets lower and lower and lower and lower. So it goes from 4,200 to a couple hundred to less than 100 to less than 10 to none. Right. So in a, and that happens rapidly. So this huge persecution leads to this rapid decline and probably local extinction or at least massive decline in that species in that location. So the bounty clearly had a huge impact. There are other ways in which people have impacts just through general persecution, not being paid to kill rattlesnakes, but just generally speaking, not liking them and killing them on site. Now, persecution is interesting. It can come in different forms. Right. Persecution can happen because you know, people sort of come, ac come across the Massasauga and, and, and kill it when they find it. But it can also be something that happens as the result of people who are interested in ecology. And we wouldn't think that's the case. But here's an example. Keenline in 1968 did a thesis with the University of Minnesota, and he worked in Wisconsin at a site in Wisconsin. At that site for his thesis, studying the ecology of Massasaugas, he killed over 320 adults and over 200 young at that site. So he killed over 520 Massasaugas at his site for his thesis research on Massasaugas. Now, back then, they, they you know, there was a little bit loose about, well, we, we've got to kill these things so we can dissect them and look at their food habitats. Or we've got to dissect them so we can look at, you know, aspects of their reproductive biology. And, and I understand that. But the reason why Keenline conducted this thesis is, or was, as he states, more ecological information will be necessary if for some reason it is found necessary to eradicate it as a menace to human life or to manage it as a sport animal. So basically Keenline conducted this work where he killed hundreds of Massasaugas so that he could learn how to kill more Massasaugas, right? So persecution can come from lots of different places. It's not necessarily just people that don't like snakes or that don't like natural resources, right? And that's had a huge toll on this organism. So we think about this, we think about, oh man, you know, there's this huge persecution that's happened. They've declined in numbers dramatically. What do we do? What's next? How can we correct this problem? Well, it's really hard to know the best course of action here, unfortunately. There's so much information we don't know about things like Massasaugas, right? So much information we don't know. So, I mean, things like Wisconsin population dynamics, the effects of climate variation, best management practices. I mean, the, the, the problem is now those Massasaugas exist in such low numbers in the state that it's hard to effectively study them and get high enough sample sizes to actually answer these questions, right? So it's really a problem. It's really problematic. How is it that we find enough information, we find uh, we're able to compile enough information on these organisms to effectively conserve them? And that's really a challenge with working with rare species. We don't know, right? We need so much more info, but they're so difficult to study that it's really hard to say that we can effectively, we're gonna figure out Wisconsin population dynamics. We're gonna do a great job at it. Uh, when we only have a handful of sites where you might catch a couple of individuals, right? Really problematic for this organism. The next one I wanna talk about is the ornate box turtle, right? And the ornate box turtle is one of these species that requires sand prairie or savanna. Uh, it needs open habitat, like we see in the picture on the back of the slide. And again, not just prairie or savanna, but prairie or savanna that specifically has really deep sandy soil or loamy soil deposits because this organism needs to get below the frost line in the winter. Right. It can't it doesn't go into the water. It can't get underwater for the winter. It has to dig down, you know, three plus feet to get below that frost line in the winter. So it needs loose soil here in southeastern Wisconsin, where I live and where uh, um, many of you are from. We have prairie or historically we had prairie savanna, but a lot of that was the soil was clay and glacial deposit. So it's not something that ornate box turtles could easily dig through, but the sandy soils that they really thrive in, they can dig down into that and get below the frost line. And so they used to be relatively common in parts of the state where that habitat existed, primarily southwestern Wisconsin probably. And today we have only a handful of sites where ornate box turtles persist. And so again, we have to wonder what happened. The species that, you know, theoretically was found in a lot of places in southwestern Wisconsin and now is just found in isolated 
you know, places, isolated populations in certain parts of that region of the state, well, what happened? Now, I had mentioned the specific habitat needs and loss of that habitat. This is really, really highlighted by the ornate box turtle. If we look at this black box represents today where we find most ornate box turtles in Wisconsin, right? Now, if we look at that part of the state, we can see in the mid 1800s, that was or had a lot of grassland shrubby habitat, the green on that map, right? So lots of grassland savanna habitat. That's also a region where there's lots of sandy soils, deep sandy deposits. If we compare that to today, that same area, not much of that habitat left, right? Lots of it has been converted over to working land. So much of that habitat that they had in the mid 1800s is gone, right? So now much of that has been converted to agricultural habitat where any box turtles don't do as well. So there's a huge loss of habitat. And what's that, what that means is that we tend to find ornate box turtles sequestered to protected areas that are kind of isolated in that part of the state. Here's a preserve owned by the DNR. Here's a preserve owned by the Nature Conservancy. Here's a preserve that's part of Fish and Wildlife Service, right? So there's isolated preserves, hard for these turtles to interact with each other. And we end up getting population genetic problems, we think, because of that. So again, like with the Massasauga, what's next? And unfortunately, we have the same problem here. There's more information needed on how these individual species or how this individual species behaves. We don't know much about Wisconsin population dynamics. We don't know much about Wisconsin population genetics, hardly anything. Uh, again, if they're isolated at specific sites, we would expect that would reduce genetic diversity because only individuals from that site are breeding with each other. A couple of years ago, I was involved in a telemetry project where we tracked ornate box turtles. And in fact, this picture shows here is the telemetry uh, transmitter with the antenna. And here is a, a thermal, uh, a temperature monitor button. And so we track turtles and we got, you know, we tracked 20 something turtles for a couple of years. We got good information on those turtles, but we got good information on turtles at one site, right? So what does that tell us about the entire state? It tells us a lot about that site, but how do we conserve them in a very broad sense? Hard to say because we don't have information like we do from that site at all of the other sites that exist. And all of those other sites are isolated. Maybe the turtles are behaved differently than they did in the past. We don't know much about the effects of population or habitat management. As an organism that has to um, be in these open sandy areas and those habitats are those that we tend to burn to reduce shrubby vegetation in growth. Well, that can be a problem for a turtle that can't outrun a fire, right? How is it that we burn habitat effectively without killing turtles in the process? And that's something that we've been trying to get a better idea on because we clearly need to burn prairie habitat, but we also don't want to kill endangered species in the process of it. So this is a question too about them that I found interesting since doing the telemetry work. And that's what drives habitat selection. And why I bring that up is because we track these turtles at this site, right? This beautiful, nice prairie site. And we thought, well, this is exactly what turtles would need. Why would they ever leave? And we found certain turtles that selected to, they didn't have to, they made the decision to leave this prairie and go into an adjacent cornfield. They didn't have to, right? They said, you know what? I'm in this prairie right now. Oh, and that's great, but I'm going to go over into this cornfield and hang out for a while. So here we can see the individual right there, right, in this cornfield. Why would they do that? Why would they leave this high quality prairie to get into a cornfield where they might get crushed by one of those giant irrigation arms or where there presumably isn't let as much food because they spray pesticides? So why would they go there? And the thing is, if that is better habitat, why didn't all of the turtles go there? So why is it that some said, yeah, I'm going to do this. And others said, well, why? I'm not doing that. That's not good. So there's all of these questions that we don't understand, unfortunately. And it makes understand it. And, and, and studying these organisms is very challenging because there are so few of them. And it's. Uh, Tim, does this seem like a good point to, to stop at? Um, sure. I think, uh, I think, um, I, I think, well, either my computer, or your computer, the last like 15 seconds, uh, froze out. But, uh, other than oh, that, wow. it, I, other than that, it was completely flawless. I mean, that was the only time I, again, it could have been mine. I think this is a great place to stop if folks have questions. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this is, I mean, I'd, I'd love to hear, <laughs> I'd love to hear more. I don't know. Do you have a, maybe one, one more 
short case study? Sure. Or? I can talk real quick about the Blanding's turtle here. Um, so another turtle species in Wisconsin, the Blanding's turtle, which many of you have probably uh, had experience with or at least seen or heard of. They're found um, throughout much of the state and we see them here in southeastern Wisconsin. The Blanding's turtle is a really interesting species because it is the only turtle that is kind of a wetland habitat uh, specialist, right? Um, you know, painted turtles end up in wetlands, snapping turtles end up in wetlands, of course, but um, Blanding's turtle, but those turtles, I'm sorry, will also end up in rivers and streams and all kinds of different situations. Um, Blanding's turtles are really a wetland species, or sometimes you find them in big backwater um, marsh habitats along big rivers, or if there's a lake that has a big thick littoral zone with dense wetlands, but they're really a wetland species. And so they're considered currently protected here in Wisconsin. They were threatened, but they were downgraded a couple of years ago. Uh, and what's what we have found about Blanding's turtles is that they really don't, it doesn't seem at least that they prefer just one wetland, right? They prefer lots of different wetlands that they can kind of, we call it pond hopping. They pond hop, they go to this one and this one, this one. So they like lots of complexes of many small wetland habitats. Now, the reason is because some of those wetlands uh, are used for foraging, right? So in the summer, they need shallow, really productive wetlands where there's lots of food to eat. And then they need some of those wetlands for overwintering, as I talked about before. Um, they need some of those wetlands to overwinter, as I talked about before. They need to be larger and deeper. So, um, you know, they have to be able to move in between these types of wetland habitats. So they also then need the intact upland habitat in between them. Um, so that they can move freely uh, to get to these different wetland types that they need. So they like these big complexes of wetland habitat. Now that's problematic, right? If you're going to move around a lot between wetlands, then that's problematic because you've got a lot of potential sources of mortality. And so um, I'll frequently get people saying, well, we have this little wetland and I see a Blanding's turtle in there all the time. It's, you know, well, you could be seeing the same Blanding's turtle over and over and over again. And it stays there because there's nowhere else for it to go, right? It can't get anywhere else. And so that gives the impression that that Blanding's turtle is a common species. We see it all the time. Well, if you're seeing the same individual over and over again in the same wetland because it can't get anywhere else, then that's not great. Here's an example uh, from telemetry work I, I was involved with a number of years ago. And all of these black boxes uh, or black polygons represent movement patterns for individual Blanding's turtles. And then all of the different colored polygons are different habitat types. And what you can see is some of these little tiny wetlands don't show up. But every time there is a point like this for the movement patterns of one of these Blanding's turtles, it's because they move to a little wetland somewhere. So wetland moved to this wetland, moved to that wetland. This individual, this wetland, up to that part of the wetland, then over to this wetland here, and then back to that. This individual here in this wetland, and then way out here to this wetland. So another example here, we caught him here, and then it's been all of their time way over here, it bounced around and then came back. So um, they need lots of different wetlands, a, a sort of intact landscape of wetland habitats. So if we consider some uh, uh, um, habitat, I'm sorry, conservation management considerations, maintaining hydrology is very important for this type of an organism, um, making sure that the wetlands they have are uh, present and available. We're not raising or lowering water levels unnaturally. In the past, one of the ways that they would manage waterfowl habitat was to draw that water down in the winter uh, and expose uh, wetland banks and, and, and uh, benthic areas. Well, obviously, that's where turtles might overwinter. And if that happens, you expose those turtles in the winter and it kills the turtles. So, you know, maintaining hydrology is really important to maintaining uh, populations of Blanding's turtles. But then again, also maintaining wetlands with high connectivity. So complexes of lots of different wetlands. So they can kind of pond hop between these wetlands of different depth, different, you know, sort of sun exposure, productivity et cetera, et cetera. So um, in general, and this is my sort of guideline, a real broad sense, you'll, if, you, if you ever look at the book, you'll see me talk about it in the conservation section. Uh, it's maintaining a variable landscape in general for conservation and management of amphibians and reptiles. A heterogeneous habitat from a structural perspective, lots of different pockets of, you know, shrubby vegetation that's native and then open areas and, you know, and then wooded and wetlands that have, you know, logs and the shores are convoluted with variable depths and, you know, woody debris out in places and just a variable landscape structurally. A lot of heterogeneity is really good in general for amphibians and reptiles. All right.
So maybe I'll stop there. Uh, that was the last thing about the blinding turtle. Um, Tim, what do you think? I mean, I I could listen forever. Maybe I mean, I can keep going, a, right? But <laughs> that's that's a great place to that's a great place to stop. I do I do have one really request, and I'm and um, just very briefly, uh, you know, as 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 you know, um, the there was a lot of controversy over the Butler's garter snake here in Milwaukee, and I tell a story, you know, of how that, uh, how, you know, for and for those of you who haven't heard, that's it's kind of a. Um, you know, it's it's a if if there's a Milwaukee snake, that's it. When you look at its its distribution, um, but maybe it, very briefly, like if you you had your elevator speech about what happened with the Butler's garter snake, because there's a mix of the economic, the political, the biology. What how how what would you say happened with that with the Butler's? Well, the Butler's garter snake is a very frustrating story, um, and so. And it's really convoluted and, 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 and can be kind of long. And so Butler's garter snake is a, is a species that is endemic to the upper Midwest. And it's only found in, you know, a handful of states here in the upper Midwest. And really Wisconsin is the only state that has decent numbers, right? So unfortunately in Wisconsin, it is found primarily in Southeastern Wisconsin as Tim alluded to, right? And Southeastern Wisconsin just happens to be a part of the state that has lots of people where there's lots of development pressure. And so that snake, because it was listed as threatened here in Wisconsin, um, that snake drew the ire of local politicians and the Milwaukee Builders Association, because many of the projects they wanted to implement um, could not be implemented because there was this threatened snake in the region. And it slowed things down. Now, if, when I talked to people that I was close with at the DNR, um, they would tell me that there was not, they could think of only one project that completely didn't happen because of the Butler's garter snake. The other projects were slowed down, right? But they, the vast majority of those projects still happened. It's just that they got slowed down. Now that may be changed after the last, you know, 15 years. I haven't, you know, looked into it since. But the, the point is, is that it was a snake that caused sort of problems, right? And there was a fair amount of money and political pressure involved. And so because of that, there was a drive uh, originally when I first got involved in it among uh, the uh, the Milwaukee Builders Association and then um, local politicians to delist that species. They said, you know what? Um, we don't think this snake is really all that rare. So um, we'd like to see it downgraded and not protected in Wisconsin. Um, and they didn't really have any evidence to back that up. Um, but at that time, when, when, when things were, and, and I don't know all the ins and outs of this, right? It's, so I don't wanna you know, be, be, be telling tales out of school. But at that time, uh, I remember going to meetings, the Joint Committee of Rules and Regulations meeting uh, committee, I think it was, and whoever had control, whichever party had control, Democrat or Republican, and I'm not saying you should vote one way or another, but whoever had control in the House and Senate had control of that committee. They had the committee chair and they had the majority. And so we went to these meetings because at that time, the, the Republicans had control of that committee, right? And meeting after meeting after meeting, and, and we'd say, well, look, there's no evidence to, to say this should be downlisted. And they say, well, I don't understand why you can't just pick every Butler's garter snake up you find and let them go at Jackson's Marsh, right? <laughs> and or they'd say things like, well, I see snakes this big all the time, right? They, they, there's no way that snake is rare. So, you know, it was really hard to, to engage with them in a reasonable manner about it. Well, before they delisted the snake, they decided, you know what, we are going to wait until after the next election cycle. So it doesn't seem like this is politically motivated. They waited until after the election cycle, power in that committee shifted. Uh, and at the next meeting, um, the chair of the committee said, is this something we want to pursue? And I'm paraphrasing, but basically everybody said, nope, and done. That was it right? So it really highlights the, it's a story I tell my students, not because I want them to vote one way or another at all, but because it highlights the problem with interactions between politics and social issues when it comes to conservation, right? It's not just about the science. It's not just about what's best for the organism. And so that is really a massive challenge that we face as conservation biologists is really the social interaction component of it. Now the snake has since been delisted and that's a whole other story, but, um, or it's been downgraded to special concern from threat, but that's a whole other story. So um, there is some discussion of that in the in, in the book actually. And, and uh, Eric Hyland wrote that chapter, but. Good, 
Um, yeah. Good.